Institute for putting on this great conference and for inviting me to participate again. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with everyone at Heartland, and uh, I want to say a word about everybody on the uh, panel here. I've known Rob Bradley for a long time, and he is one of the ornaments of the free market environmental movement. And if you want to know the history of many of the, the major issues uh, in the movement and, uh, and what the free market environmental uh, uh, response to these issues is, talk to Rob. So he's, he's, he's uh, invaluable. Ken Cuccinelli, uh, since he, he got honest employment and left the, uh, the employee of the uh, state of Virginia, um, we've worked with uh, FreedomWorks for years, and it's a great pleasure always to work with Ken. And uh, FreedomWorks was very, uh, uh, um, uh, you, well, let me go back. At lunch, Sam Kasman asked the question about dishwashers. Well, CEI filed a petition with the Department of Energy to create a new class of dishwashers, which they could then regulate in a lighter way called uh, effective dis dishwashers or fast dishwashers or dishwashers that get your dishes clean. Um, <laughs> and FreedomWorks uh, helped us get, I think, 2,600 comments, and they're all individual. They're, every, every person has their own gripe about it. They were happy to gripe to yeah. the federal government Very about that. And then Jennifer uh, Fielder, I haven't known for so long, but uh, I'm a I'm a, a fellow rural Westerner, and I've spent a long time working and trying to figure out how to defederalize the West. And the American Lands Council, which was started by Ken Ivory and now is in the very capable hands of Jennifer Fielder, is the first positive development in trying to defederalize the West. I encourage everybody to, to pick up her material, get her card, get involved in this. The federal government is killing the West. It's been doing it for a long time, but at an accelerating pace. They're killing the economy and the environment. My family's ranch in eastern Oregon in August of 2015, I spent three days watching it being burned down by a fire started from a lightning strike on BLM land and Forest Service land that eventually burned up 107,000 acres, including all 2,000 acres of our summer range up in the mountains. So, uh, and it's entirely due to mismanagement, entirely. So, now I want to talk about permitting. Uh, this is an issue that the Trump administration has not gotten right. They've gotten some of it right, but they don't really understand certain things. Uh, let me start by saying uh, Mick Mulvaney was our, the dinner speaker at CEI's annual dinner in June. He's the superstar of this administration as the head of OMB, in my, my view. I mean, he, he really is the superstar. Mick Mulvaney said, you know, I don't think the economic effects of our tax cuts have, are just beginning. I just think they're, they're, we're just starting to see them. The real effects, the, the economic rebound that you're already seeing is due to our deregulatory efforts. Now, my colleague Wayne Cruz produces 10,000 commandments, an annual snapshot of the regulatory state. In that, he identifies all of the costs that have been identified of our regulatory state. And right now, it's $1.9 trillion per year. The biggest chunk of that, nearly $400 billion per year, is environmental regulation. But that doesn't begin to, that's the tip of the iceberg. And the reason is because there's no way to measure what are called opportunity costs. That is to say, those things that people do not invest in because of the regulation. So the cost of these environmental regulations is the cost of current business. But this is foregone investment. It's huge, particularly in resource industries and in manufacturing. It's gigantic. Everybody who's been in these industries know that. And one of the reasons is because of a thing called the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970 and the Clean Water Act of 1972. Together, these two statutes have combined to create a regulatory monster. President Donald Trump recognizes that. During the campaign, he kept saying, and we're going to speed up the permitting process because too many projects are delayed to death. I don't think he used the delayed to death, but that's, that's a summary of what he was saying. Projects that require federal permits, 
how long do you think it should take to get a permit? Well, if it's hard rock mining, Jennifer had one that's been going on for, what, 30 years? Uh, Perry Penley has an oil lease, uh, Perry Penley Mountain States Legal Foundation has an oil lease that was granted in Montana in 1982 and the guy is still trying to drill his first exploratory well on that piece of ground. Typical multi-billion dollar investments in resource industries now take permitting, have permitting delays of 10, 15, 20 years. How many projects are just simply dissolve, the, the investors lose interest and go elsewhere. They typically go to Canada because a mining project in Canada can get permitted in two years. So the Trump administration, uh, last, uh, last August, uh, President Trump uh, had an executive order with a very long title. And this was part of his infrastructure proposal. Executive Order on Establishing Discipline and Accountability in the Environmental Review and Permitting Process for Infrastructure. Now, the problem with this is the last two words, for infrastructure. It's fine to speed up federal permitting for federal projects, but we need to speed up permitting for private projects that require federal permits, because that's where economic growth and wealth and job creation come from. They don't come from, well, yeah, creating, do, building federal in, infrastructure can cr do all those things. But it's primarily private investment that makes the economy go, not federal investment. So on 12th, the 12th of February, the, the uh, administration re released its infrastructure proposal that it wants Congress to enact, and it's a lot of new spending. I, I just say it as a, a digression, CEI opposes that. Um, but one of the things in terms of permitting reform that they suggested was getting rid of the Environmental Protection Agency's veto authority over Clean Water Act permits. This is called Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I first want to say they then released a memorandum of understanding between uh, the various government departments on how to expedite the executive order on permitting reform for infrastructure. And again, they get it wrong. It only, the agreement only applies to expediting permitting reform for federal projects. Now, I, want, I do want to say one good thing about that, however. Secretary Zinke at the Interior Department and his uh, deputy, David Bernhardt, have instituted a new plan for environmental impact statements. Uh, a typical environmental impact statement in the early days of, of uh, NEPA would be 40 pages or 100 pages. Uh, now there are tens of thousands of pages, and they take many years to produce. And one of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, the Pebble Mine in Alaska, they have spent $135 million in doing the studies for their environmental impact statement permit. A, a, a wetlands permit uh, to dredge and fill under the Clean Water Act, $135 million. So what Secretary Zinke has done is say, for, for our EISs that we produce at the Department of the Interior, and this includes Fish and Wildlife, National Park Service, BLM, Office of Minerals, uh, and the, the Offshore Office, whatever, uh, Offshore Oil Office, whatever that's called now, B-O-E-M, -B does anyone know what that, well, anyway, doesn't matter. Um, he said our EISs are going to be limited to 150 pages. So, so people can actually read them, right? Uh, and, and they've instituted, and I think Jason Funes is here, he can maybe confirm this. He's from the Department of the Interior. I think you saw him earlier today, heard him earlier today. They've, instead of uh, delaying the, 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 the consideration process, they now, uh, it used to be, and this is standard of bureaucracies, if you got a document that needs approval or, or review by various offices, you send it around, and each office might sit on it for a month or six months or two years, and then eventually when it goes all the way around, then you say you're finished. Well, what Interior has done is to say we're going to get all of the people who were involved in this together in a room, and we're going to sit at a table, and we're going to go through it. 
So that's, that's great. Isn't that great? Okay, so now let me get to EPA, and this is where I think the problems really start. Scott Pruitt uh, uh, last fall uh, impl uh, started a process to review what's called the Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment in Alaska. This was a $600,000 cut and paste job done by uh, the Obama EPA to block uh, one of the world's largest copper and gold mines called the Pebble Project in southwestern Alaska. This project is on state lands. These lands were chosen in the 1980s as part of the Alaska land settlement for their mineral potential. Uh, the EPA did a, a $600,000 cut and paste study and they said that any mining development in Bristol Bay watershed could threaten the salmon fishery. Bristol, the Bristol Bay watershed is an area the size of Ohio, 40,000 square miles. Uh, it has very little economic activity. And uh, the mine, the model mine that they, they decided to use to decide whether the, 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 the mining effluent could get into the Bristol Bay and hurt the salmon was based on 1950s technology. So based on that, they, they vetoed, uh, they, they, a determination was made by the administrator to veto the Bristol Bay, uh, the Pebble Project in Bristol Bay. Now what's interesting about this is under Section 404, the EPA can veto the Corps of Engineers issuing a, a dredge and fill permit under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. They can veto it. But under the Obama administration, two interesting things were done. They vetoed a coal mine in West Virginia called the Spruce Mine after it, the permit had been granted and the investment had been made in the mine. So it was a retroactive veto. Think about that. With the Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment, they vetoed preemptively a project before it had applied for its environmental impact statement, before it had submitted its environmental impact statement to get a Clean Water Act dredge and fill permit. A preemptive veto. Now think about the consequences of this, not for the Pebble Project, but for this country. This is de facto federal land use zoning. This is say, we're, we can take any huge area of this country we like, an area the size of Ohio, let's say. Well, what if it were Ohio? And say, we're not going to have any resource development here because we've decided it might hurt the environment. And that will be done before any expert studies have been done in the EIS process. As I said, the Pebble Project spent $135 million preparing their environmental impact statement. EPA spent $600,000. So now, Scott Pruitt did something great in July, soon before he resigned, which is he said, I'm going to require, we're not sure when we're going to get legislation ref, uh, removing EPA's authority to veto Clean Water Act permits. So instead, uh, I'm going to ask uh, that a rule be prepared to put some sidebars on this process. And we're going to remove our ability to do preemptive and retroactive vetoes. Well, that's great. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. He gets it. But he didn't go back and say, there's one preemptive veto that's on the books, and we're going to look at it and take it back and that is the Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment and the determination made that would veto the Pebble Project and all other mining projects in an area the size of Ohio, the Bristol Bay Watershed. So he, he's got the principle right, but he couldn't apply it to this one thing that is the one thing that's actually active right now, which is a, yes, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, Jim, I'm virtually done. He, he didn't apply it to the one decision that would actually have an immediate effect on creating economic growth in this country, one of the biggest mining projects in the world, the Pebble Project. So this is just, uh, you know, it's bizarre and I can't figure it out, so I, I'm gonna invite your help. I have a handout which I'll put on the table and if you wanna pick it up, 
uh, on the way out. So thank you very much.